So hey everyone, uh, I'm Josh. Uh, I've been working, um, yeah, so I've uh, finished my degree at um, the University of Auckland, uh, Bachelor of Science, Physics and Maths. Uh, I've been working with uh, Chris Wolf on the SkyMap data. So um, just quickly, the project was going to be about uh, using the Kepler data, but unfortunately the uh, uh, data for that hadn't come through in time, so we had to quickly change to the SkyMapper uh, data. So I've been looking at the uh, quasar variability of the SkyMapper telescope. So, so there's SkyMapper there. It's a 1.35 uh, meter telescope. Uh, the uh, summer scholars got a chance to go and see it inside in the spring. It's just about seven hours north from here. It's that's pretty cool. Uh, there are some advantages of using SkyMapper over Kepler. The first one being uh, you can observe heat more quasars. So uh, in the fields that we were using, there are about 50 fields, uh, we, we had about 1,500 quasars that uh, the Sloan survey had uh, detected. So that's another survey telescope in New Mexico. Uh, this is about uh, 68 <coughs> that Kepler was looking at. Uh, so. Uh, oh, we also had, uh, so SkyMapper has a whole lot of different uh, waveband filters, so we've got information on, on yeah, a number of different waveband, uh, which can uh, give us information on how they're varying across the different um, wavelengths. Uh, but there's a big disadvantage, and that is that, uh, so the data is from uh, June the 2nd to uh, July the 7th, uh, 2014, that was what we were working with. Um, but out of those 35 nights, uh, we only got a maximum of 13 observations in um, a particular field uh, due to like uh, the weather conditions, which is a bit disappointing, versus Kepler, which is um, which took, takes an exposure every 30 minutes. Uh, so over, over that 35-day uh, period, that would be about 1,600 data points, uh, which is a lot more than our 13 that we used to go work with what we got. So, uh, and yeah, also errors in atmospheric conditions for SkyMapper as it's a ground-based telescope. So what is a quasar? That's a quasar there. Uh, it, it's a massive black hole at the center of a galaxy with a very hot and luminous accretion disk around it. And uh, it also, has these big jets that come out either end of it. Um, and so when, when the quasar is heated, it changes luminosity. So uh, what happens if there's like a, an X-ray burst at the centre, uh, we, we get uh, heating right at, in the inner parts of the accretion disk. And so we should see a spike in the shorter wavelength. And then as it uh, progresses outward, uh, uh, where the accretion disk is a little bit cooler, uh, we should see a spike in the shorter wavelength, uh, sorry, the longer wavelength. And so, yeah, we don't know too much about uh, quasars in, in these sort of time, these short time frames. So that was sort of the motivation, um, seeing if we can see that. And if we can, hopefully we could uh, say something about the size of the accretion disk. So that was sort of like what we were hoping to do. Um, so what sort of data are we dealing with? So we had 50 fields, uh, four filters ranging across the visible spectrum, uh, approximately seven days in each of the fields, but uh, we, we got some with 13, some with like three, which weren't very handy. So in total about uh, 1,500, uh, 1,516 images. So each field is 5.7 square degrees, and the, the moon is about uh, 0.2 squared, so uh, if we, one field would be about five by five moons, uh, but with the 50 fields, that's uh, 1,430 moon total area. So it's quite, a, we're looking at quite a big area. Uh, so we use this uh, program called Source Extractor, and that basically just picked out the objects uh, in, uh, in our images, and we got about 200,000 um, real objects. So we, we had a look at the different apertures that were uh, to use, and we went with uh, the six arc second aperture 
because uh, what well, we tried doing small apertures and uh, extrapolating that out to try to get the total flux, but we found that the error that that um, extrapolation brought in was actually uh, two, uh, was a lot bigger than just using um, the six aperture. And so yeah, what, what we wanted to do with the uh, data is pick out these variable objects. So if, a, if an object's not variable, the, uh, the flux or the, the magnitude would stay about the same. So, so the standard deviation or the error in it um, uh, should be pretty small. Uh, and if it's variable, then yeah, it would be pretty high. So what we're looking at here is the standard error versus the apparent magnitude. And this is in the R band. Uh, which is 615 nanometers, and this is just uh, one of the fields, one of the uh, better fields. And the points plotted here are only objects that had 10 or more observations. Uh, but I should say before this that uh, we had a few problems uh, with the data, so it's not uh, optimal data. Uh, firstly, it's just raw data, so uh, we haven't um, done anything um, to it, uh, a field subtraction and uh, we also found some dome obscuration so uh, the dome was uh, blocking well we found evidence for the dome blocking part of the mirror so as you can see here this is just the difference in magnitude between two nights and it's all fine here but uh, here it kind of drops off which is evidence that there was some dome obscuration so that that means that our sensitivity was a lot less uh, than what we would have liked so yeah uh, so the, the objects that follow this trend here, the, the red trend, are the um, objects that aren't varying too much. Uh, we've also got the blue dots here. These, so these are the quasars that uh, Sloan had catalogued already. So I just plotted them there. And um, as you can see, most of them are sort of in this uh, noisy area. But these ones here are the variable objects here. So I need to find a way of selecting these objects. And the way I did it was I just uh, minus off this trend and then divided by the standard deviation. So minusing off the trend, you get that, and it, it's, it flattens out there, and you get uh, a broad. You still get this broad, um, this broadening here. Uh, the broadening, by the way, is because uh, these, these less, uh, these dimmer objects, so uh, sky noise. Uh, creates these areas which make it a lot bigger and broaden it. Uh, and then, so to get rid of that, you just divide by the standard deviation and that's what you get there. So I drew a line there. This is a um, very, very significant plot. And we have here at uh, four sigma, I uh, drew a line and see that the ones above this are the variable objects. So here they are here, which is actually quite interesting because like when I first looked at it, I would have thought like up there is quite variable, but as you can see, there's like a lot of noise in here, so it doesn't actually translate to a very variable object. It's still variable, but not as big as this one here. Uh, but so so as, uh, this one here, the uh, the one that I plotted in magenta, is one of the quasars that uh, was above that four sigma threshold, and so that was uh, a variable quasar with the sensitivity that we were using. Um, so. And this actually happens to be the only quasar out of the ones we had that was really uh, significant to look at because a lot of the, uh, with a lot of the other uh, fields, we only got two to three measurements, which wasn't very useful. So this, I plotted a light curve for this, which is here. So we've got uh, three wave bands here. Uh, there, so that's uh, the, the wavelength, and that's the width. Um, and we have the day number, so across the 35 days. And as you can see, there are only about, well, oh, there are only 13 measurements most of them. There isn't one there um, for the like, uh, weather and stuff. Uh, but so we, we were looking for this one day sort of time lag, one to two day sort of time lag between uh, the, the spikes. Um, but as you can see, it's not really that useful because, well, these areas are quite big and, and we really needed like a more more data points to have a real good look at it. Uh, these these ones these areas are a lot bigger than these ones for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it's a dimmer object. Uh, sorry, it's, it's dimmer in these uh, wavelengths, uh, and uh, it's 
only a 30 nanometer width as opposed to these ones, which are a lot bigger, so like less light is hitting at, uh, the detectors, so in that filter, so uh, the, the sky noise creeps in. Um, so, yeah, our, our goal was it, uh, to detect these sort of time lags. We didn't really reach it, but so I, I, put in, I put in just another variable object. This is a possible RLIRI star. Uh, I don't know too much about them, but uh, uh, I just plotted the points for it. As you can see, it's sort of a, a varying star like this. Uh, I also plotted the uh, the color change. So I just I just minus off the, um, the the green bands from the red band, and that gives you the color change. And it's what you'd expect. As the object gets dimmer, it gets uh, redder, and um, vice versa, it goes um, back and forth like that. And also you can see that there's sort of like a bit of a cluster here and a cluster here. That's typical of uh, an object, a variable object that um, has these sort of soft edges. It's sort of like a, if you think of like a uh, sine wave, you know, it will see most of its time in the maximum and the minimum. Um, so where to from here? So first thing is we could uh, account for the dome obscuration. So uh, we could just uh, model that and try subtract it out of our data and see if that actually uh, increases our sensitivity. Uh, well, well, so we could use so the the Kepler data. Uh, it just so happened that one of the 68 quasars uh, was actually this one was one of the 68 quasars. So what we could do with the Kepler data is use uh, that as a model for this. And, and see if we can just match it up with this, uh, these three different um, uh, bands, and see if we can detect some sort of time lag um, just by shifting it. Uh, and, and if we if we can't, uh, what we could do is just say, for instance, bring down these these errors and try it again and see if that um, see how far we're going to bring down the errors to actually uh, to actually detect these sorts of time lags. Um, uh, another thing that we could do is just make a histogram of the quasar variability uh, versus the non-variable objects and that, that should uh, give us a better idea in general how much these quasars are varying uh, which will uh, again give us another indication of uh, what sort of sensitivity we need to get down to. Uh, and then in the very long term the LSST is a uh, big survey telescope that's being built in uh, Chile, 8.4 meters. It's going to have 50 times the sensitivity of SkyMapper. So uh, that, there'll be in a few years though uh, when it's built, but uh, using that would be uh, quite handy. Um, it will give us a better idea of how these quasars are varying. So yeah, that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening and uh, thank you to Chris uh, Wolf for being such an amazing supervisor, always willing to listen to me and uh, ready to answer any question that I had. So, yeah, thank you. Um, any questions for Joshua? Yeah. And did you have a zero point all the images by matching up the field stars or something? Yeah. Because you said it was. Initially uncalibrated data, I guess. Yeah, uh, so so uh, one of the things we had to do, so if I flip back to, uh, so the dome obscuration, uh, ob obscuration there, for example, uh, the difference between two nights should actually lie at zero. So we, we did calibrate across nights. Um, so yeah, um, that was one of the things we did. Any more questions? Okay, um, I think that brings us to a close then.